I attended a high school about 15 minutes from the US-Mexico border. In one of my first times sharing this information with my peers here at UCSB, I was met with genuine concern and sympathy, as if I had fought in a war instead of literally just going to high school. So now, when I introduce my high school, I'm sure to include stories about how I fought off drug cartels every day on my way to math class. In all seriousness, I am grateful to have attended Benita Vista High School. For those unfamiliar with Spanish, Benita Vista translates to beautiful view, which is ironic, because Benita has an absolutely hideous campus. For example, there was a rat infestation in the lockers we were banned from using, desks that would give you splinters every time you sat down, and gum on the floor everywhere. <laughs> Despite the state of our campus, I was challenged in rigorous international baccalaureate and advanced placement classes, competed and joined with a state and nationally ranked speech and debate team, and even became my own class's president. While, of course, I enjoy reliving my high school successes, this is all just to say I went to an amazing high school. Unfortunately, academic achievement is never enough in Benita's case. At my school, White kids were actually a minority, and I was mostly going to school alongside other Mexican students. 65% of Benita's 2,000 students identified themselves as Mexican, according to US News. Sadly, my school's diversity and rundown campus earned us a reputation as a ghetto school. The incorrect and unwarranted use of the word ghetto places the backbreaking weight of harmful stereotypes onto the students that are attending these schools and the surrounding communities that are thus roped in. The kids that attend these schools are then left to grapple with the belief that none of them will succeed because of the environment that they're learning in. That's even ignoring further extenuating circumstances like overcrowded, dirty classrooms, over-policing, and a lack of access to resources that would guide these kids to success in the first place. To call a school ghetto is to nurse the idea that because a school has predominantly minority students or a less than perfect campus, that it is inherently a place that can only guide kids to failure. To many, that claim may seem rather harsh. I mean, surely the kids that called my high school ghetto meant no harm to the students or to the surrounding community. However, it is because of the lack of knowledge surrounding the word ghetto that schools and communities like mine are feeling the lasting effects of the negative stereotypes associated with the term. It is because of these lasting effects that in today's speech, I'm going to explore the modern appropriation of the word ghetto, as well as the impact its usage has in schools. Then hopefully I can encourage people to understand the word and its long history before using it as a replacement for things they find less than perfect. For people living in the United States, the word ghetto has been associated with black people throughout the modern century. However, the word actually finds its origins across the seas in Europe, where it was first used to describe Jewish neighborhoods. As explained by Daniel Schwartz, associate professor of history at the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences, the word was actually used first in 1516 in Venice, Italy. In the city, Jewish people were confined and even imprisoned in a small neighborhood near a copper foundry or factory. A foundry in Venetian is called a ghetto, which is how Schwartz infers the term was first used to describe Jewish enclaves. These ghettos in Italy were eventually dismantled when Jewish people were emancipated in the 19th century, as, a, as found by Camilla Demonsky, a journalist from NPR. However, the term returned in a much more sinister manner during World War II. During the Holocaust, Nazis reconstructed ghettos that were strictly controlled and aimed to make their attempt to complete a genocide against Jewish people a simpler task. These tragic stories of continued oppression against Jewish people built ghetto into a nasty word, one used to refer to neighborhoods that people were forced to live in. Unfortunately, the word didn't disappear after World War II. Around the 1950s, ghetto began to shift meanings. The word found its way into the United States with all of the negative connotations following close behind. As black people were migrating from the more rural US South to the urban North, 
the government made efforts to keep them controlled and confined, as had been done to Jewish people in Europe. As Hugo Quintino writes for the Michigan Daily, policies forcing black and minority families into economically and politically disadvantaged areas altered the meaning of ghetto to refer to an urban area with abundant crime, violence, and extreme poverty. This is the definition we are familiar with today. When describing the modern day ghetto, many people's minds jump to what they see in the media. Video games like Grand Theft Auto depict the ghetto as a lawless land, but one that you can do anything you want in so long as you don't let the police catch on. Movies and TV shows try to present the grim tale of the ghetto. Gang members strolling through twists and turns of rundown houses and apartment complexes, guns drawn ready to start a fight, or young girls slouched on the corner in short dresses waiting to get picked up, or drug dealers rolling by in their nice cars. In almost all of these depictions, the people shown are black, Latino, or poor. If you look up ghettos in the United States, you can find a list of the top 10 most ghetto cities in the United States, written by a random guy named Marky Young, who doesn't seem to have actually gone to any of the places he talks about. In most of these cities, you won't be surprised to find that the population is made up of mostly minorities. The use of the word ghetto to describe these neighborhoods is already harmful, given the word's long history and all of the negative connotations that are associated with it. The world of the media is a powerful one, and so many people have their views of these neighborhoods shaped by it entirely. But it's imperative that we remember people live in these neighborhoods, and these people have long been tormented by economic and political oppression, racism, sexism, and a plethora of other tactics made to keep them in these neighborhoods and out of wealthier white ones, away from political power and economic mobility. There are kids growing up in these ghettos, but so many people have their minds set that they refuse to believe that a ghetto is anything but a lawless land. The kids growing up in ghettos are a commonly overlooked demographic, and most don't consider how growing up in a so-called ghetto school can impact their development. While many imagine a ghetto as a neighborhood that's entirely different and foreign to their own, there are more commonalities than you realize. These neighborhoods have public schools, grocery stores, and parks, just like any other neighborhood. The main and unfortunate difference is that these public utilities are chronically underfunded. What's worse, is that the problem lives beyond the material level and exists in the language that we use when we refer to these schools and students. Amongst today's youth, as explained by Monique Fields in her article, Insult or Inclusive, It's All Ghetto, ghetto means more than just a rundown or dangerous neighborhood. In fact, today, ghetto can refer to a way to speak, a way to act, a way to dress, and most commonly, is used to encompass stereotypes that are associated with black and Latino people. This new invention of the phrase then separates being ghetto from an actual ghetto, leaving any school with an ugly campus at high risk of being considered ghetto. When my sister was in high school, she watched students from a school 45 minutes north of us get off of their charter bus stricken with looks of disbelief at the front entrance of our school. As they got off the bus, the white coach from this mostly white high school warned her students, saying, do not leave this campus. Stay with a buddy at all times. This is a dangerous neighborhood. I grew up two blocks from my high school. It is hardly a dangerous neighborhood. What it is, is a predominantly Mexican neighborhood. Kids from that same school regularly called my school ghetto. They often asked me if I did or dealt drugs. For those that don't know me, I had a 4.7 GPA in high school. I regularly played Dungeons and Dragons, and I ate lunch in my English teacher's classroom literally every day. None of that mattered, 
because I'm Mexican and attended a school that they thought to be ghetto. Being labeled as a ghetto school for my peers and I meant that we were expected to behave above and beyond expectations, especially if we had any important visitor coming from some, someplace else because they already had such low expectations of us. It meant having a security guard on campus at all times, if not an actual police officer. It meant knowing that nobody was expecting us to succeed. And every time we demonstrated that we were, in fact, smart kids, we were met with overwhelming and immensely condescending congratulations. This was the reality at my school. And the same is true for so many schools whose populations are made up of mostly minorities. It becomes a sort of cycle where the ghetto label sets expectations low and only allows students to achieve what's deemed possible of a ghetto kid. For example, in a study conducted by Kenzo Sung through the University of California, Berkeley in 2016, he found that in Oakland, one of America's most well-known ghettos, 95% of residents were non-white. In the same study, Sung found that a third of adults had less than a ninth grade education, half didn't graduate from high school, and less than 10% graduated from college. Oakland schools are chronically underfunded, and as recently as January of 2022, they're facing even more extreme budget cuts. Ashley McBride writes in her Oakland Side article that Oakland Unified Schools in the school district are dealing with a $50 million budget cut largely due to chronic absenteeism. This is especially curious when you consider that even sick days count towards being chronically absent. It's not like we've been going through a global pandemic. But even more so, these kids don't want to go to school because it's clear that their schools don't care about them. It's not that these kids aren't smart or unmotivated. The entire system is working against them. When a school and its teachers don't believe in a student, they can hardly be expected to achieve greatness. A study con conducted by Ray Rist in the 1970s examines this phenomenon by exploring how a student-teacher relationship can impact a student's educational journey. He found that willingly or unwillingly, teachers select students who they believe have the ability to succeed in class and set expectations high for them. The rest of the students are then left on the sidelines without much support from their teacher. At the very beginning of the year, when the teacher organized her groups of students based on her evaluations of who might be successful, a clear pattern emerged. Those students that would likely be stereotyped in the modern day as ghetto were those that were deemed failures from the start. Those students were not given the same learning opportunities and instead were treated as an afterthought. Obviously, that doesn't give them the same academic opportunities as their peers. Rist also noted that this division in the classroom shaped the students' attitudes towards one another. Those who were deemed type A held a sense of superiority over their peers, and in the most extreme cases, were even hostile towards them. The so-called bad kids acted out as well, often mirroring the language that their teacher and peers were using against them. In the following grade, the same students were yet again sorted into the A group, with the rest sorted below. In the next grade, the same cycle repeated. At this point, students weren't being judged on a beginning of the year evaluation, but instead on past performance. Thus, this self-fulfilling prophecy presents itself in the most horrifying way. Students who are expected to succeed will succeed. Students who are expected to fail will fail. The most horrifying part of this study, it was conducted in a kindergarten classroom and followed students into first and second grade. When a teacher's biased evaluation of a student is removed, it becomes, just how, it becomes clear just how unfair schooling can be for students that are often stereotyped as ghetto. In a 1968 study compiled by Rosenthal and Jacobson, they found that 
or they randomly selected a group of students who they then told the teacher were set to be fast learners who would do well in class. At the very beginning of the study, all of the students' IQs were tested, and in the end, the randomly selected group of students had gained more IQ and improved their reading when compared to their peers. Both of these studies are still relevant today because students are still being told, whether directly or indirectly, that they are not the type to succeed. Although it may seem minor, it's important that we scrutinize our language, especially considering that it contributes directly to harmful cycles that are preventing kids from learning at their fullest capacity. Labeling a school as ghetto or a student as struggling is part of the reason they're having these problems in the first place. Demonstrating any kind of disbelief in ability due to a pre-existing bias is stopping these kids from learning at their fullest potential. If instead, we were to lift all students and schools to the same standard, these so-called ghetto schools and struggling students might start showing better results. Some might argue that it's important for a student to experience a kind of tough love and that it might even push them to improve. There are instances of this happening in a 1984 study completed by Margaret Fuller that looked at black girls at a school in London. The young girls were labeled as low achievers and instead took that as a challenge and worked really hard to prove that label wrong. While sure, some students might take being labeled as ghetto or otherwise as a challenge, that doesn't mean labeling kids is a good thing. And even more so, there are still bound to be kids who fall through the cracks and are negatively affected by the way they were labeled in school, potentially for the rest of their lives. A change in our vocabulary is long overdue. Whether it be in descriptions of students or schools, it's time that we throw out any language that invokes any stereotypes of a race, class, or gender. In a country where minorities already deal with continuous oppression at the hands of their government, the least we could do would be changing the way we speak. Letting kids grow up free of labels like ghetto means letting them grow up to their fullest potential. Put simply, the word ghetto needs to stop being used as a replacement for something that's viewed as bad. If you mean bad, call it bad or ugly or whatever it is you truly mean. There are so many ways that the way we speak brings negativity into the world around us. It's time that instead we use our language to make the world around us better. Thank you.